I have to say this, this was an um, absolutely amazing conference. Um, I cannot thank our panelists enough. I cannot thank Jonathan enough, who is just incredible. It has been such an honor to get to know you, Jonathan. Um, so as Jim said, this is the result of about the last year, Woody and Jim put together a, um, a task force saying, okay, we should, uh, we should probably, you know, mediate.com has been around for 25 years at this point. We should probably take a step back and say, are there any areas that we should improve any places where we should look at standards and, and talk about um, possible tweaks or examine the direction that we're going. And so they put Jonathan and I in charge of the youth and schools task force saying, okay, we should figure out how to improve the dispute resolution path for youth and for schools. And, you know, it was the funniest thing. I realized, gosh, dang it. I'm not a youth anymore. I don't know the answer to this. So we decided to hold this conference to ask other people from around the world, okay, as youths, what do you think? How can we improve? How, what are obstacles that you're facing? How can we best guide you? Um, I, I'm gonna steal Jonathan's um, visual for a second here, but Jonathan was saying that we have to realize that us as the older generation, we're not the ones pushing on the gas anymore. We're not the ones who are driving this and who are excited about new concepts and all the, all the places that dispute resolution is going in the world. It, that's being taken over. So the youth is the one that's now pushing the gas pedal. It's just us to, it's up to us as the, as the more, as the older generation of mediators to, to guide the steering wheel a little bit. And so that's really what we wanted to do. We wanted to step back and say, okay, where are you going? Where are you excited about taking dispute resolution in the world and how can we help? And so we spent two days doing that. We looked at six different topics and we, we just had people from all around the world. It was amazing. And there were definitely a couple of moments as people shared, this is what's happening in my community, or this is how these skills have helped, I don't know, the guerrilla warfare or community issues or alleviating the 50 year court docket that we're facing. And they were sharing these stories of how dispute resolution has impacted them so personally. And I could start hearing it's a small world playing in the background and got a little teary eyed. It was, it was a pretty amazing experience to be a part of. So with that being said, let's get into some of the, some of the good stuff. So here's how, um, here's how we were planning on structuring this. Uh, Jonathan and I are going to do a quick overview of the, um, of the six different sessions that we looked at. And we have some of our amazing panelists have joined, which I'm so excited about. So I'd love to, to have them join in and share some of their feedback. Then we're going to assign you all to different breakout rooms because I'm going to surface the obstacles that they discussed. And then your task, there we go. And then your task in the breakout rooms is going to be to discuss these obstacles and see if you can come up with some solutions. So what are some of the things from your experience that you think might help these particular areas? Um, then we're gonna come back as a group and just absorb all of your wisdom, okay? So without further ado, let's go ahead and I'll share my screen here. So, um, <clears throat> so I've shared, thank you, Jim, for all the links that you've been sharing. I want to add a couple more here. Um, so- oh, yeah, this, yeah, push your back on the back of Hold on. There we are. Okay. Um, so this is the article that summarizes everything that was discussed in those six sessions. And so I would recommend, um, it's right here. I just put it in the chat. I would recommend pulling this up and following along with it. Cause this is definitely the, the in-depth, I'm just going to be going over a, a quick summary of pieces. Okay. So presenting. Sorry, I have to move a Zoom control out of the way. And present. Ta-da, okay, here we are. New voices in dispute resolution. Um, so first, I just want to, I want to welcome everybody that we got to know over those couple of days. And a lot of these people, you all were troopers. A lot of you were getting up at 
two in the morning and then again at seven in the morning to make it to these different sessions because again these were people from all around the world that were joining us at all kinds of wonky time zones so first thank you for doing that and it was i'm excited to hear about where all of you are going to go in life so um here's where our panelists were from uh, as you can see it was definitely a, a very diverse group and i've put i've put a link to all of our panelists and their biographies this is just a screenshot of them in the chat as well um just leaders that are doing very exciting things around the world so it's it's worth looking looking them up maybe connecting with them on linkedin um because these are going to be the the top names in the next five ten years okay so then we had to decide what in the world are we going to talk about and this was tough if you have this wealth of knowledge how in the world do you decide what is the most important thing to look at and so here are the six pieces that we decided on diversity technology funding training career and mental health skills um and and again we saw those as the main the main pieces that the that youth mediators are are wanting to discuss okay so i'm going to start with diversity and then i'll throw it to jonathan so um we decided that the main goal with diversity was to bring everyone to the table we didn't want any voice to feel like they were left behind and that the goal was for diversity to really focus on three unique areas awareness of dispute resolution affordability of dispute resolution and accessibility and the and a, quite a few different cultures stepped in and said this all sounds great, but you don't realize in our community, <clears throat> there's not a clear path. You know, there isn't an obvious master's program that you go to. There isn't a job description. You're not going to look up on Indeed and find mediator there as an example. And the few people that were mediators around them, um, it, it was kind of that they had come into it by default. For instance, they'd been a judge for 30 years. And then they were just taking on a couple of cases as a mediator. And so a lot of people said they didn't feel like they had a role model. There wasn't any representation that they could look to and say, oh, now I understand. I connect with that person. I can relate to that person. I want to follow that path. And again, they were saying that they didn't feel that there was a lot of support for youth and women. So uh, I'm going to be honest. I feel like we need to take a little bit, um, a little bit of ownership over that one. So it at mediate.com, some of the things that we're trying to do is just make sure that that the articles that we're publishing and the mediators that we're promoting are representing lots of different voices, ages, ethnicities, genders, background, communities, so that people do see themselves represented. They do see someone there that they can connect with, that they can follow their path and understand, oh, okay, this is how we become a mediator. This is a path similar to mine that I can relate to. And so, so that was one of the first solutions that we came up with. But again, I'm going to be throwing some of you in a breakout room. So hopefully you can come up with some other some other suggestions here. OK, so that's my quick summary. Again, if we have any of the panelists from the, the diversity crew, um, please feel free to jump in and add your thoughts. Oh, good. There's Melanie. Hi, Claire. And hi to everybody else. Uh, it's good to see you all. And there's not so much I, I would want to add. There was a great summary of, of the session as far as I also um, saw, because we were also in, in different breakout rooms. Mm -hmm. um, the one point I would want to add is that another solution or path to a solution we came up with was to implement more co-mediations. Mm -hmm. As this would be one way to tackle that many people are not aware of any ways to increase diversity that for example an older and a younger mediator could have a co-mediation together and so one could see what the other doesn't see and could address something the other one doesn't address yeah. so that was um, also in my opinion one of the the great ideas that the participants uh, came up with. And I think this is also an easy way to implement. It's not that it needs 
huge changes in in everything it's just easily implemented and can also already make a big impact i think yeah and one of the things they were talking about was that co-mediation doesn't necessarily have to mean two people that went through the same training sitting together at the table but it could be for instance melanie and i could co-mediate something from opposite sides of the world and that if we could start to normalize this as part of our basic mediation that instead of just teaching the, the straightforward 40 hour mediation path, but start to look at, oh, here's how they do things in Brazil. And here's, here's some Ho'oponopono techniques that we can take from Hawaii and starting to pull in some of that um, diversity of processes that then that would make it a little bit easier to co-mediate with people around the world. So I, I loved those ideas. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you. All right, any other thoughts on this one or uh, should I hand it over to Jonathan? Okay. Thanks, Claire. Uh, once again, thank you for trusting me with this process. Uh, ever since uh, I got to know you, uh, you uh, Claire was my first editor ever since I first started writing in the world of mediation and I believe I've become a better writer. I'm just assuming that since she does not really correct my mistakes uh, that much anymore. So. Uh, I want to once again thanks, uh, thank uh, Jim and uh, Colin for once again giving me this privilege of being part of this advisory board, the task force. And I would uh, apologize and also seek permission from everyone else. But I have a bit of a fanboy moment right now with, uh, with regards to Mr. Forrest Mostyn. I quickly went to my cupboard and guess what I found? I don't know if everyone can see the screen right now, but... Uh, <laughs> this is this is a trophy I won in 2015, and I will write more about this sometime. But now that I see your face here, Mr. Mostyn, I can't help but uh, tell you a quick story that uh, if it was not for this international client counseling competition that I first won in 2015, or rather finished runners-up, sorry, uh, I would never have encountered the world of mediation. And here, I, here am I today, uh, seeing you, of course, virtually. I'm sure you had no idea about this, but... Uh, and I've not come prepared for this, but as I see you there, uh, I just felt like I had a bit of a fanboy moment. So thank you for the inspiration. <laughs> he clearly All has right. good taste. <laughs> yes. Uh, and so getting back to technology, I think um, I keep bugging Colin this question about how much of this uh, is going to stay online once you know the world starts spinning around again and you know life comes back to normal whenever that's going to be. We have no idea. And Colin kept saying that it's not about how much of it is going to stay online, but how much of it actually is going to go offline. So we've got so used to technology right now and the world is, uh, you know, everything is uh, turning uh, right below us as we speak. The world of technology has taken over our lives. So I think if I could summarize what was being discussed in that session was that, yes, it is here to stay. Yes, artificial intelligence is going to help mediation practitioners go forward. I think the common theme that everyone was talking about is to kind of make sure that the sophistication that technology brings into our life does not precede the human needs. And therefore, whatever technology we are using has to be basically something that is associated with the, with the need of the human being. So it cannot replace the human being, but of course, to assist the human being. Uh, being part of uh, you know that, that particular mediation or any kind of dispute resolution process. So artificial intelligence is here to stay, but it's basically uh, we don't want to make we want to make sure that the sophistication does not precede the needs of the practitioner. Uh, three other things that I think are very very crucial. One is trust. Um, uh, we have to make sure that we find ways to make this, pro uh, we make to use technology and provide that safety and security for all users who are using it. And we have to focus on that. And we cannot take it for granted that just because we think it's safe and secure, the user thinks it's safe and secure. And we cannot force them to come onto a platform just because we think it's safe and secure. Training was another point with regards to technology. Not everyone has adequate training to understand uh, uh, different softwares, different technology that's out there. Uh, uh, so I, I worked with mediators uh, and senior lawyers who have never ever used Zoom before last summer. And suddenly now they are experts 12 months on. And that's because they have given themselves out there to go and learn and actually go out there and 
explore different technologies and different software. So we have to continue to focus on training uh, with regards to training uh, you know, ourselves with regards to understanding technology and, and separately beyond mediation or dispute resolution. Um, and I think thirdly, with regards to technology, there was, uh, there was also talk about how we got to make sure to find that balance between the lives that we live in the digital world today, thanks to technology, everything is work from home or work online. And therefore, how do we find that balance between, uh, you know, how many hours of work are we putting in? Are we feeling unproductive at the end of this? And, and therefore, how do we draw the line? And where do we draw the line? And what time do we shut off our computers and say there's a life beyond this? And so um, I would say this is a summary of basically what we discussed in the discuss technology. I also want to bring to your notice some very, very interesting points brought out by, so Claire made us do this exercise towards the end where she asked us, you know, uh, what we would like to see uh, change, uh, you know, what, what, what's our dream uh, technology uh, 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 idea that we would like to see come to life in say five to 10 years from now. And there were different responses and you can read all this on the website actually, the same link that Claire was referring to, uh, where some of us spoke about, uh, you know, an artificial intelligent app maybe which helps uh, us, you know, keep confidentiality intact. There were those who said, uh, you know, something that helps us determine time zones directly, maybe an, a software that helps us analyze people's facial uh, expressions, uh, if they're lying or if they're angry, maybe, um, maybe an artificial intelligence app that basically assesses how useful uh, you know, this session is being to their clients. Uh, maybe how do you check on the mood of a client while he or she is speaking. So uh, the ideas that came out, they were pretty crazy. And uh, you know, we said that all these can actually come to life and uh, they're quite possible. So the future is bright. Uh, and we are, I think the, the, the final, I would say if I could summarize it in one line is that this is here to stay, but we have to, at the end of the day, make sure that we are taking all precautions uh, to keep this safe and secure for all the users. And if there is anyone from the technology uh, session who is joining us today, uh, of course, this was chaired by uh, Benjamin Lutz, uh, Chisholm Uzuela, and Salman Shaheen uh, from the US, Nigeria, and Saudi Arabia, respectively. If any of the three of you are online, please uh, feel free to uh, chip in and add to what I've said. I think if not, I'm going to hand this over to Claire. Yeah, I think all three of them said that they couldn't they couldn't make it. So yeah, thank you. Great summary. Um, it was really interesting, the ideas that people came up with. So that I agree, it's worth going through the, the comments on that one. Okay, <clears throat> so now I get to talk about funding. Um, and, and I really liked how um, Amy Duramshi phrased the, the funding session. Um, mainly she said that when people are looking at their careers, they just keep thinking, okay, how can I get money? How can I get money for training? How can I get money for getting the experience that I need? How can I get money to market myself? And she did say that it makes sense to be creative about how you're getting money. For instance, um, could you work with an organization that might want to give you a scholarship, something like that? But she said it actually makes a lot more sense to, to change the question. And instead of saying, how can I get money? Instead, make a list of what are the key things that you need. So you do need training. You need experience. You need to be able to market yourself. And you need to be able to maintain your practice with things like technology. And do you have to pay rent? And you need internet and, and ongoing training and licensure and all of that. Um, so she said, instead of just saying, how can I get money? She said, let's, let's take a step back and be very creative about how can we meet those goals? Yes, being able to get a master's in dispute resolution is amazing, but that might not be the training that you need right now. So looking at community mediation programs, sure, looking at different online options, or, and this is one that I really liked, I thought this was a fantastic idea, if you can't afford to go and um, go to a basic mediation training, what if instead you offer to moderate one 
and do the work of putting it together and finding the venue and finding the speakers and getting it accredited. And then you get to sit through an amazing basic mediation training that you're, you're essentially volunteering at and hosting, and you're doing it completely for, for free, or you might even get paid for hosting this. So she had a lot of really creative solutions for how you can get these different boxes checked without really needing to worry about funding. Um, and again, she said, it makes sense to, to reach out to a lot of larger organizations and uh, Jay Patrick Santiago had some great ideas for this one as well, looking at different scholarship opportunities, um, maybe working with organizations or worth or with different firms to say, hey, it seems like you need a uh, training in such and such. How about I help you organize that? And then you can receive funding from them and and again, listen in on those trainings or once you've already done the training, then you can say, hey, we already have a relationship. Why don't I be your go-to mediator? And then you can start to get experience that way. Um, so for those of you who are, uh, who are starting out or maybe you're mentoring someone, I would definitely go through the different ideas in the funding session because I, I thought that was a pretty vibrant brainstorm. Um, I don't think Amy or Jay Patrick were able to join us. Um, uh, Amy has a site called, oh, I'm blanking on the dispute den, dialogue den, dispute den. Dialogue den. Thank you, dialogue den. Um, and the marketing that she's done there is, is very impressive. So again, for those of you who are, are still kind of deciding on the feel you want for your website or your blog, I would recommend going through that because it's very clean and, and it's very modern. It's a great example of how you can be resourceful, but still a without feeling heavy handed, you know, without looking stodgy and stoic. It's, it's very vibrant and fresh and, and energetic. It's, it's a, she did a great job. Um, and then again, Jay Patrick had some fantastic marketing ideas for how you can reach those funding goals without just needing to say, Hey, I have no money. I can't do this. Uh, anything else that you all wanted to add to that one? I'm good. Okay, so yes, for those of you who are going to be in the funding breakout room, I think we can all relate to, uh, to the obstacles that are here, right? There are a lot of things that we do need to be able to pay for to be a good mediator. And what are some of the good ways to, to meet those goals? Okay, so with that, uh, I'm gonna hand it back to you, Jonathan, to give us a review of training. <laughs> Great, so we spoke about diversity, uh, technology, uh, funding, and now training. I do see Sumaya as, uh, who was one of our panelists, she's joining us from Sri Lanka. And she, uh, uh, Sumaya, please feel free to chip in once I try my best to summarize what went down in that session. It was a very interesting session. Uh, um, and uh, so there were a lot of questions asked, of course. Uh, some, of the, some of the participants commented that training courses are too short. Uh, some of them said that they're too expensive, uh, especially for students and recent graduates to invest in. Uh, makes us question maybe, uh, uh, you know, an age old practice that we've been having as mediators. Is the 40 hour training now outdated? Do we need something that's longer and more sustainable, something that's more spread out so that, you know, everyone can engage in this, especially in this world right now where we are doing a lot of online trainings. Another concern was that, uh, a lot of young mediators are concerned that, you know, they do invest, say, in a mediation training, and then they're not recognized as mediators. Uh, and I'll give an example for that from my background back here in India. If I do a private mediation training, uh, the courts in India do not recognize that because they do have their own separate trainings for court uh, annex mediators or court, uh, or court mediators who work in the court annex mediation centers. And so uh, courts back, uh, I'm speaking from my experience back in India, I'm not sure how this would resonate with all of you across the world. And uh, feel free to please touch upon this topic when, especially in the breakout room that's discussing training. Uh, do you struggle with being recognized after doing a particular training or after doing a, a private, uh, a training in the private uh, institute? Uh, when, when you go out there and advertise yourself, or, you know, put yourself out there in the market, do you struggle to then, uh, sell your brand uh, because it's not recognized maybe by a jurisdiction or whatever. Uh, 
there were some comments by some of the participants saying that the styles and approaches and the trainings are too, you know, too outdated, too mundane. They would like to see more things being taught to them uh, while they're being trained, new uh, updated versions of how mediations work. Uh, we probably got too stuck upon our, our textbook style of, uh, of mediating, especially with the facilitative and evaluative and transformative styles. Maybe, maybe the, the new generation wants to see something different and uh, they, are, they are inviting us uh, to, you know, to push ourselves to give them something more, give them, give them something different. Um, they did say that they liked the fact that now they can get onto the self-paced trainings, which are, uh, you know, which span across maybe weeks and months. Uh, and it's easy for them to assimilate things because they, they do a one or two hour session, they watch a video, and then they can actually think about it, come back with questions. And that's really helpful uh, compared to, you know, traveling to a nice fancy city, uh, staying in a nice hotel, and then coming in for an eight hour session every day for five hours to finish a 40 hour training. And, you know, you're exhausted by the end of it. You have not really got time to reflect on what you have learned. So they do, they do see, uh, see the value in doing this uh, trainings online, which are spread across uh, you know, you know, weeks and months. Uh, another quick point that was mentioned is to, uh, beyond training is to keep yourself out, updated, is to make sure that you find a mentor who can, to whom you can keep speaking uh, uh, about maybe uh, how you're progressing with regards to what you have learned, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, what you have you know, uh, explored, uh, differently in this mediation training. It might not always be the case that your trainer could be your mentor because you know, all our lives are really busy and you know, we have got so many engagements, but it might be somebody else who you have met in the training who was more senior to you and that person could be your, uh, could be your mentor. Um, yeah, I, I see another point on the slideshow which says that this training should not be just a one-time thing, but these trainings should be a lifelong thing. I know a senior mediator back here in India who still attends trainings and he is, I think, now in his mid-60s, if I'm not mistaken. And I'm not going to take out his name because then I'll, he'll probably say I, I said the wrong age now. <laughs> but uh, he, he almost, he attends every training that's out there. He keeps updating himself every two, two years. And that's, that's brilliant. So I think that's, that's something that's also recommended by the, the next generation of, of mediators. Uh, more diversity with you know, different voices maybe. Uh, with regards to uh, the, 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 the reading uh, materials that are being provided for the trainings. So the new generation wants to be updated with everything that's going on. They're not just uh, textbook style or you know, mediation training. Um, yeah, and of course, I think they're also looking for international standards uh, with regards to their training. So basically something, if, if you're trained in mediation in, in India or in, you know, any, in, in Asia or South America or Europe or America or Australia, uh, that training should be valuable to you if, you if you jump to a cross-continental mediation someday in your career. And that's what they're looking for, that these, that these standards are international, these standards are, uh, uh, will, will help them wherever they go and whatever kind of mediation they have to be uh, engaged in. So Maya, please uh, join in and uh, please add to anything that I have missed out on. Yeah, thank you so much, Jonathan, for that. That was a really good summary. And I think you touched upon a lot of things that we discussed in our session. Um, and I think one of the main things that uh, came uh, up when we were discussing training was um, awareness and uh, the opportunities that are there for the youth. Um, and I shared with the participants uh, something that I did uh, in my university along with my batchmates um, was uh, we created this society uh, where we started uh, by training students on various uh, dispute resolution methods, uh, which also included mediation. Uh, and we also encouraged them to take part in competitions, uh, both local and international. Um, and this was our way of bringing mediation and other dispute resolution mechanisms into our university uh, and teaching our students uh, more about it. Uh, now we have uh, an alumni from our university as well, including myself, uh, who coach teams for these competitions. Um, and uh, this, this is what we uh, shared uh, during our breakout rooms as well. And, um, we spoke about how this could be uh, one way uh, in which um, 
uh, students could, uh, you know, get into training. Uh, and I too started uh, my mediation journey through competitions. Uh, so um, that was a great way in which I was also able to network um, and um, connect with the mediation community. So that was also uh, one of the things that uh, we spoke about. Uh, yes, and I think you covered everything else, Jonathan. Thanks, Sumaya. Thanks for bringing it up, actually. Uh, tra uh, competitions, mediation competitions work as great, uh, you know, continued education programs. You know, it, the, uh, it, beyond the 40-hour training, that's one place you can actually test your skills and get feedback. Uh, and uh, thank you for bringing that up. I also see Ilan who has joined us. Ilan, are you with us? Would you like to add to the training bit uh, at the conference? A quick summary, maybe, on um, your side? Hi, Jonathan. Um, I am here. I am on a bus right now. I don't know if you can hear me. Um, so uh, I actually came to the pathway through. So I don't really want to make a comment, but I mean, everything that you and Samir said is, is, is really great. Um, and uh, yeah, I just want to say that it was really uh, an honor to participate in the uh, conference. And um, yeah, I was glad to lend my experience about um, mediation training to the conference, but I think we definitely covered uh, the point. So thanks, and uh, I'm sorry if it's noisy in the background. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. One of the things that Alan um, continued to mention and that I couldn't agree with more that Jonathan has also mentioned is just the idea of having a, having a standard training. How amazing would that be if we had, let's say, Mediate.com set the standards or CEDAR or AAA, or we just had some governing body saying, here are the things that need to be in a basic mediation training. And once you have completed that training, then you can, you can mediate disputes around the world. And I realize that's a big thought, but let's be honest, that's where we're going. You know, right now, everybody's sitting online and we are mediating disputes between the UK and Israel or between Brazil and Saudi Arabia. So I, I really like the idea and I hope that this conversation isn't dropped, but I hope we continue it about pushing forward the ideas of what are the standards? What are the things around the world that we need to make sure to be included in a mediation training? And then of course, if it makes sense to add on an additional couple hour piece to familiarize yourself with local jurisdiction and local confidentiality rules, obviously let's add that on. But why not come up with some kind of a standard so that we can say, oh, we'd really like to hire Jonathan for this international dispute. And look at that, he's taken the international mediation accreditation. And so we know that he's he's qualified to handle this. I, I really feel like whether or not this is what we want, because I know a lot of mediators get, a, get nervous when we have this conversation. I think whether or not this is what we want, I think this is where we're going. So I feel like we should start to have this conversation now about what are the key things that should be in, included in that training. So yeah, thanks. Sorry for jumping on your soapbox there, Jonathan. No, I think, thank you so much for that. I think that was a good uh, wrap up of that session. Uh, over to you, Claire. Okay, thanks. Okay, so then uh, this was our fifth session and it was on, um, <clears throat> it was on career. And this one was really fun. I, I, I absolutely enjoyed this one. Um, again, for anyone that is entering the field or even if you just want to, if you want to hone your practice, absolutely watch this video. The, the suggestions that came out of it were incredible. Um, I have a high schooler and I made her sit and watch the video because I think there were just so many, so many great pieces about how to, how to have a really strong CV, how to connect with people in your future career, um, how, to, how to determine what your brand is. So obviously with career, um, the big question for any new mediator is how do I get cases? And uh, so Benjamin Lutz was there from Mediators Beyond Borders, and he gave us some great suggestions about um, how you can quantify soft skills. So as you are selling yourself as a mediator, how you can say not just I'm an active listener, but how you can quantify that and, and talk about the very specific deliverables. What does the, how does that translate to your clients? Why do they want to hire you? 
because you're an, a good listener. Um, so lots of good suggestions there. And then Nishant came in and talked about not just how do you quantify yourself, but really marketing yourself. And one of the overwhelming themes that I heard, I'd love to hear if, if, if you have some other opinions on this, Jonathan, but one of the big themes that I heard was social media, social media, get out there on social media, market yourself like crazy. LinkedIn is a really good start, but LinkedIn isn't enough. Um, and it was, it was a lot about just getting out onto a lot of different directories, social media sites, um, putting together marketing pieces. So short videos, little snippets that describe yourself, putting out funny memes that talk about dispute resolution, constantly writing blogs and articles, commenting on other people. Uh, they talked about Jeff Kitchhaven a lot, and they were using him as an example of somebody who's writing some interesting articles, not necessarily incredibly lengthy and academic and overwhelming articles, but just something that you can sit down and read for a couple minutes. And he's interspersing those with lots of, um, here, are, here are quick funny videos, or here's a funny joke, or here's a one-liner about mediation and its importance. And so they're just things that are really easy to digest. And the key here is that then he's, it's that what Jim Malamud always discusses, the top of mind marketing, right? So he's just always putting himself out there, commenting on lots of other people's articles, promoting conferences. And this was hard to hear. It made me feel very old. And they said that that is where you need to be putting your time, much more so than a website. Even though it is important to have a website because that's kind of your, your resource clearinghouse, they said, that's not really where, where people are finding you anymore. That's not really where they're getting cases. It's more, do you have a very strong directory? Um, are, you, do you, are you putting out lots of articles? Do you have a newsletter or something where you're continually putting yourself out there? And they said, that's really where we're putting our time because that's where we're seeing a better return on investment. So I thought that was, that was very interesting. Um, and Nishant just kept reminding us, specific is terrific. The more specific you can be about, this is what I offer. This is who I am. These are the, this is what the mediation process looks like. That that's what, that's what people are really wanting. Um, that there used to be kind of this, uh, oh, the legal field is, is big and it's massive and it's confusing. And that's why I have to hire a lawyer because I don't know how to break through this. It's impenetrable. But they said what people are really wanting now is that connection, that transparency. They want to see behind what's behind the curtain and that the more mediators can offer that and say, hey, this is exactly what the process looks like. This is my fee structure, or this is a short video describing it, or this is about how long I expect it to take. This is how I'm going to be, and this is how I'm going to help you. And these are the documents that I'll provide at the end. The more specific we can be, that that is really reassuring clients and saying, oh, did you see what Sumi, did you see what Regina is offering? Did you see what Neha is offering? That's what I want. I know what I'm getting. I feel good. I feel like I can trust her. That's what I want. So again, I, I was very impressed with that one. I think that was a great session that I recommend watching. Um, anything that you all want to add? I see Nishant online, Claire. Oh, yay, good. Can get him on audio. Nishant, you want to add to what Claire has already said? Maybe uh, anything else that you have reflected beyond that session? No, I think Claire uh, summed it up uh, pretty well. And I think, um, yes, we, we ha I did manage to connect with a few attendees from the session. Thank you. And um, they have started implementing what has been said. It, building your brand is not going to happen overnight. It is a three or four month process. Um, points were laid down in the session as to how they can do so. And um, yes, uh, I, I got a call yesterday itself from one of the participants saying that, okay, people have, since the time that they have started putting themselves out there and educating the people, um, people have started reaching out to them to understand more about just what mediation is, what they're wanting to do. So um, yes, that was a feedback that you know I got yesterday itself. Um, right. So yes, that, that was that. Great. Um, and Nishant had this had this suggestion, which I thought was invaluable, and I'm adopting this. Um, give yourself, for instance, three months. So I, I'm calling this the three by three, the Nishant three by three. Give yourself three months. Focus on three specific platforms, and be out there at least every three days. 
commenting, sharing articles, writing blogs, and just watch how your business starts to increase that now you're not just selling yourself to other mediators and promoting yourself, but you're out there in the community. And that's really where your target audience is living. So you're writing articles, you're promoting them, you're posting little videos of yourself. And that's something at Mediate that we've always said, we'd love to help. If you want to post a video on your directory, let us know, let's get you out there. And, um, and Nisha, and I hope it's okay. I would recommend if people have more questions about this, maybe to connect with you on cool. LinkedIn because he had just very valuable ideas, I thought. Yes, I'd, I'd definitely um, love to connect because I, I think it's um, there needs to be a balance between um, branding yourself and mediation. I always say it's always good to brand yourself by educating your viewers or the readers. Um, so it's, 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 it's tricky. It's, it's not about only about putting yourself out there, but also putting out the concept of mediation uh, because only when people get to understand what mediation is, will they associate you with it and come to you um, for assist assistance. So a lot of students, at least I know for a fact, they, they end up just you know, branding their own work, um, not realizing that I as a layman don't understand what that certification means or what mediation means or what it mm -hmm. um, what. And then that's where uh, it's about slightly educating the layman and uh, through that education process building yourself. So yes, I'd be more than happy to connect um, with members on LinkedIn, sure. Love it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so I think with that, I'm going to throw it to Jonathan for a final session. And this one was on mental health skills. Um, and, and this one was, was interesting. I wasn't prepared for um, how well received this one was going to be. I didn't realize how important the session was. Like I'd I knew that mental health was important and that we've been talking about it more in workplaces and protecting people's mental health. But this was a, a very hot topic. And it was, especially I think after this last year, when people are experiencing quite a bit of Zoom burnout and Zoom fatigue, and that feeling that, well, since I'm at home already, I might as well get a little bit more work done. You know, who cares if it's Friday night at midnight, I might as well just finish up this report. And and so a lot of the session was just talking about how, um, how destructive that is, that that is just not a long-term solution and that we deserve to treat ourselves better than that. So with that being said, Jonathan, thank you for pushing the session and leading it. Um, I, I, I learned a lot. And I think that a lot of the other people there walked away from it feeling a little bit more empowered to, to protect themselves and their skills. So thank you. Okay, let me hand it off to you. Yeah, I think they're missing Lydia here because I think she had a fantastic presentation. Uh, Lydia was my co-chair uh, mm -hmm. on this particular session and she did a fantastic job bringing out uh, the mental health, uh, uh, the importance of mental health in the profession. And I know that uh, Claire and Nishant have lit the fire under your feet right now to go out there on social media and brand yourselves and put yourselves out there. But I want to throw some water on that for a little while and calm things down because as much as we're going out there on social media and talking about things and talking about ourselves and our achievements and what we have done and what we have written and what we have read, and uh, this can also lead to a bit of insanity. Uh, and I've had people coming up to me and saying, I have quit LinkedIn because I just can't take it anymore. It's just, there's too much of vanity out there, right? And uh, I understand the people who feel that way. And, and there, are, there are some of us who cannot cope up with you know, everything that's going on around us. When we see someone else has done a training, we're like, oh, I got to do that training now next. Or if someone else has been uh, impaneled in a particular organization, I got to do that next. Or someone else has, you know, and that could be getting into us, that could be getting into our system. And we might not accept that. They might be in denial at some stage, but uh, for, for, for a young competitive environment, that, that, that does play on a lot of our minds. And how do we cope up with all that? How do we, and as Nishant was saying, how do we find that balance between putting ourselves there in the market and yet staying sane and not losing it and not losing our marbles just because everyone else around us is also uh, you know, um, in this race. So I think the summary of that session was to say this very clearly that we as mediators at least should make space for this understanding that this is not a rat race. We can all coexist together, 
right? And we can all help each other uh, uh, vent out things that we are going through. Uh, you know, I've heard this being said at a lot of conferences in my limited experience as a young mediator that it's a quite a lonely profession, right? Because we really can't share much of what we experience in a mediation because some of the things are so confidential and so private that we can't really share these things around with maybe our co media uh, our colleagues and, and peers. And therefore, how do we create the space for trust where we can talk about things that we're going, talk about the fact that we are not being able to get a case for the last six months, talk about the fact that I had to grow a beard just because so that I could uh, look like a senior mediator and get a few more cases. I'm kidding, but that could be actually a, a real problem for some of us there. For young mediators who are not taken seriously, who are not being able to find enough work for themselves. So are we getting burnt out internally? Are we running out of empathy? That's another, that's a whole different topic beyond ourselves. Are we running short of empathy when we're trying to reach out to others, especially now in the pandemic world? Where are we refilling our empathy cylinders? I know that at least back in India, the hot topic right now is where do we find an oxygen cylinder for someone who's dying in the neighborhood, right? But where, where are we filling our empathy systems? And I'm currently thinking of writing a piece on this uh, to understand where are we getting all this kindness from? Because there's so much of nonsense going on around us. Besides the positive vibes, there's a lot of negative vibes. There's hatred, there's anger, there is uncertainty. And how are we keeping ourselves sane through all this? You know. Uh, uh, and I, I'll give you an example to reflect on. Uh, in, in our busy lives as, as professionals, sometimes when we reach out to somebody uh, uh, in our business circles, maybe for, for work or just to keep in touch, we say, we, we, we sometimes start off a conversation with, hey, I hope you're doing well. So when we say, hey, I hope you're doing well, that's more like a close-ended statement right in the start where the other person is, 99% of the time, that person's going to be saying, yeah, I'm doing great. Uh, imagine what would happen if you had asked the question in the more open way and say, hey, how are you doing? And then you wait for like five minutes or 10 minutes for that person to respond. But we are so busy with our professional lives that we start, the, we start a conversation with, hey, I hope you're doing fine. And I, I know there are a few people smiling at me right now because I do that a lot myself. But the point is that we are forcing people directly to say, yeah, I'm doing fine. All right, let's get on with business. What's next? What do you want from me? What are you looking for? And so maybe we are, even the people who we really trust, people who we really matter to us, we have not found time to ask them an open-ended question. And that could be the difference between, uh, you know, you know we, we don't want to have a Chester Bennington in the mediation field anytime soon. And we don't want to be responsible for that. Uh, for those of you who did not catch that reference, that's the uh, the lead singer of the band Linkin Park, who went through a lot of difficult times, a lot of mental health problems. So uh, the, the, I think the, the summary of this is to reach out, to make this community a bit, a bit more inclusive, that we can share our struggles, share things that we're going through so that um, we realize two things. One is that uh, we, the, it's, it, there's nothing right and wrong. There are people to hear us and there might be others who are going through the same struggle and we can all learn and coexist in this mediation community. Uh, and I, I don't want to take too much more time because I, I want to really break out into this breakout rooms and discuss all this. But as Claire has been saying, and I've been saying over the last now one hour that please go to the link on media.com. There are fantastic reviews there about all these different topics. Uh, and, and, and I'm sure that will help you uh, you know, reflect on this further. Um, thank you so much. Perfect. Thank you, Jonathan. That was wonderful. Um, and I want to, I'm going to stop sharing for one moment. I have one more link that I want to show all of you. Um, so as a lot of you know, um, here we go, I'll just share this page. So as a lot of you know, um, as part of the youth conference, we also had a, um, a scholarship. And so we had a paper contest and youth could send in their, their papers, we reviewed them, and then we awarded a scholarship to the, um, to the winner. And 
And that was a lot of fun, just getting to see some of the papers that were coming in and different ideas. So I'm hoping that we can do that one again soon. So keep an eye out for that. But I wanted to share, this was our scholarship winner, uh, Boinki. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing your name incorrectly, uh, Boinki John Paul. And again, he wrote, he wrote this paper about the importance of working with unrepresented parties. And it's great, he just wrote in and said that he was able to use the scholarship winnings to finish his, um, his doctoral studies on, on conflict resolution. So that's very exciting. Uh, we had a couple of you contribute to that and then we could contribute as well. So thank you everyone, that's, um, that's exciting to know that we're able to, uh, to advance another peacemaker around the world. Okay, with that being said, so I have set up our Zoom rooms here and I'd, I'd like to try something slightly different than what we talked about earlier, Jonathan, I hope this is okay. Um, what I have done is set up six different breakout rooms. And so you can see there that you have the option to select your breakout room. And so we have room one is diversity, two is technology, three is funding, four is training, five is career, six is mental health skills. Um, and for those of you who, uh, who were one of the panelists, then um, I would love it if you could join that room and just share your, uh, share your wisdom. And then the rest of us will spread out throughout the rooms. For some of you, if you're on an iPad, this might be a little hard for you to choose a room. <clears throat> and so I can just assign you to them. But um, I haven't opened them yet. I know you're looking for them. I haven't opened them yet because I want you to stay here for just one more minute. Uh, what I would love is if the, um, uh, if we could have, so right now we're right at the hour. Can we take 15 minutes in your room, just going over some of the key obstacles and then uh, 15 minutes trying to identify a couple solutions. And then when we come back, um, that's true, Larissa. Um, okay, uh, so, um, so for those of you that would like to continue this discussion, then you can stay in the main room and we can talk about some obstacles and then you'll have uh, interpretation available. So for those of you that, that want to continue this discussion and you need the interpretation, then you can just stay in the main room. Let's do that. Um, but for all of us that would like to focus on these specific topics, then we're going to head out to the different breakout rooms. And again, uh, time yourself 15 minutes on obstacles, 15 minutes discussing solutions, and then we're going to come back and have a scribe that can report back, what is your, what is your best suggestion? What is your best solution for helping youth um, to increase diversity, increase training, yeah. increase uh, career options. Uh, Jonathan, sorry, what did you want to add? Yeah, I just thought I'll put a dis disclaimer out there that uh, uh, don't run away from the session just because they're breaking out into breakout rooms. That tends to happen sometimes. Uh, you, you are free to uh, just be a listener in the breakout mm -hmm. rooms. If you feel if you don't feel like contributing, you don't want to put your camera on and just listen, that's all right. Uh, but uh, yeah, just want to put that out there. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so I'm going to open the rooms. There we are. And again, for some of you, I know that you won't be able to actually click on the breakout room to select it. Please feel free to just um, uh, send me a chat and I'll make sure to get you in the right place. I don't see where we see. select. Um, so if you click on breakout rooms, that should be down at the bottom, then you should see the six breakout rooms there and be able to select one of them. Thank you. Yeah, that's how it's supposed to work. And if it doesn't work that way, just send me a chat. Let me know what room you want to be in and I'll put you in there. Are you able to um, let us, what are the breakout rooms? I can't see the list. Yeah. That way I can let you know which one I'd like to be in. Absolutely. So we have diversity, technology, funding, training, career, mental health. Okay. Can you, I, I'm, Ina Hall would like to be in funding. You got it. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
Hello, Dr. Claire. How are you? Hi, Radwan. Nice to hear from you. My, my pleasure. Uh, well, uh, I, I can, I, I have the option to choose, but uh, I would Mental like to join health, the group. Please. That okay. Oh. <laughs> Go ahead. I'd like to choose the room that has the least uh, amount of people. So Wonderful. does it appear? <laughs> that is technology. You would be great in that one. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, I'll just hang in here in case uh, we need to discuss uh, something Perfect. before I break out. Uh, so somebody is sharing. Denise, we're looking at your screen, just so you know. Colin's still around, maybe he could uh, stop uh, user sharing. Um, I think it's up to me. I'm just in the middle. Yes, please. Please, sorry. That's okay. Sorry, Claire. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, give me one yes. second, I'll jump in. I'm, I'm trying to send a message for you to put in the technology rooms. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> sorry. That's okay. Claire, what does one do other than click on the group you want? I clicked on training, but I don't see my name there. I try to. I'll put no, you no there. problem. I'm I'm leaving. Come back, okay? Okay, sounds great. All right, Timothy, I put you in the training breakout room, so you should be Thank able you. to just accept that. Yep. Okay. Claire, there's a request in the chat box from Aurelus. Okay, I think I already put you in a different one. Shoot. Uh, Aurelus, where did I put you? I can grab you and move you. There you are. Technology. Okay, thank you. Yep, found you. There you go. No. Okay, so you should be all set no now. Technology. I want to go to uh, mental health. Yep, I got gotcha. you. You are in there. So now when you select, you should go to mental health. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh-huh. All right. I think we have everyone all set up. Um, I have our interpreter still in here. Okay. Uh, Jonathan, I think I put you in mental health. Mm. Yeah, I'll just go there. I'm just... Uh, okay. I, are, you, are you still uh, struggling to get in there? Can, no. you see the, can you see the breakout room button at the bottom of your screen? Uh, what is a qualifier? What is a qualifier mediator? And... What I'm noticing is that a lot of the so-called qualified mediators don't have enough practice. However, the way they are evaluated, it seems like being in a rush. And even what is called like the rubric, you have to follow the process and come to an uh, agreement in an hour, which is not really the greatest way to do it. I also have the experience in Mexico where the tribunal is the one that authorized the mediators and the, the training again is not the, the coolest, you know, it's not the greatest, it's somebody who comes. And again, I think mediation is like swimming. I can teach you any, everything in theory, but if you are not on the water, mm -hmm. you are not really learning anything. Yeah. 
I agree. I think that's definitely one of the biggest problems is um, how do you get that experience? How do, how do people have a chance to actually use these soft skills? Cause you're right. It's, it's like swimming, you know, it's, it's one thing to understand the concepts, but actually to know what to do in the moment is, yeah, it just requires experience getting in there, jumping in the deep end. Um, well, let me say that differently, not jumping in the deep end. I think a lot of mediators try to do that. I think what we need more is the shallow end. We need a lot of options for them to get started and try out skills. Yeah. yeah and I think one of the challenges for people, so at least in this area, you know, a lot of places will charge for that, for that mm -hmm. opportunity um, to, to, you know, co-mediate or even observe. Right. Um, and that's, you know, so that's a, another challenge for people, you know, okay, well, I'm going to pay for this training and then I'm going to pay to watch you do something that I want to do. You know, right. I think it's a struggle for people to get over that hurdle. Um, you know, there are certain yeah. centers that don't charge, but for that experience. Yeah. So piggyback on that, Lisa. Um, like I said, we had the interns, so we didn't charge for that. Um, but not, uh, some of the parties were not comfortable with having an observer or a co-mediator that wasn't with EEOC. Um, and so that's a big obstacle too, is the confidentiality and the the comfortable, com mm -hmm. I can't talk this morning, comfortability about having a, a an outsider participating yeah. that's either not being paid or, you know, part of the program for which you signed up for, for as mm -hmm. mediation. One of, and, go ahead. And, you know, we, I actually created an uh, MPG group online so we could do role practice. It worked very well for a while, but now I, we're struggling because not everybody gets to know what, what mediation is. And if you try to be polite with them, when they are doing the, the mediator role, it is a challenge. So I don't know, we're struggling right now. It has been like for hours and we have been talking about how we can make it better. Mm -hmm. And we do it for free, but of course I put so many hours on it that it's unreal, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, what do you think about the idea of having uh, new mediators be Zoom moderators? So instead of being observers, they're like, oh, let me help you set up the session. Let me, oh, I'll monitor chat, I'll monitor documents. And then they're observing, but I feel like that might be more of an acceptable on-ramp for clients. You know, instead of having somebody in the room sitting at the table, that does feel kind of awkward. But if you have a Zoom moderator, I feel like that's very justifiable. And then, you know, new mediators can get that experience. So I don't know. I like that idea. I'm just not sure how to get it out there <laughs> and have that, you know, be kind of an acceptable practice. Right. Yeah. I think I, I know of other, some other um, private practitioners that do that. Um, so I guess, you know, I guess part of the thing for the, the mediator that is, you know, in practice is like how much control are you going to give over to that person? you know, if they are, you know, it's definitely would be helpful, you know, if, if you were mediating a case to have someone actually doing the moderation um, and moving you around, but, you know, are you comfortable with their skills? I guess there, there would have to be, you know, a whole separate training on that just to make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing mm -hmm. and not talking to. That's one of the struggles that I've had with observers and you know, as much as they say, yep, I agree, I will not say anything, you know, then they, they'll start saying something because the party asked them a question. Right. Yep. I, I remember that moment very well. <laughs> I was sitting at the table, like, I know I'm supposed to be quiet, but, but they won't survive <laughs> without my wisdom right now. I need to chime in. <laughs> yeah, I get that. Um, so, okay. What, can you think of any other avenues? I feel like right now the two main avenues for people to get experience are with the courts or with community mediation centers. And like you said, a lot of times the mediation centers are charging for that practicum experience. Um, 
have you been able to find any other options for mediators out there to, to start to practice? Um, not necessarily in our area. We, I mean, our, my center does not charge for that practicum because I look at it as I am hopefully gaining a volunteer out of this. And so yeah. usually, you know, I will, you know, we'll have them kind of sit along. And, and the other part is, you know, as a center, we want to be comfortable with their skills. And so it's like training wheels, right? You have them as observe some cases, see how you do it. Because even if you're coming from another area or another country, we had someone um, that's on our staff now come over from London and she had mediated there, but it was kind of a question of, you know, looking and making sure that she was doing things the way that we do things in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, allowing them to co-mediate with more experienced folks and then eventually taking those training wheels off and saying, okay, now you're the experienced one, <laughs> go ahead and do it. Right. I, I kind of feel like there's a lot of people that would be willing to do that. They just kind of don't know. Um, they don't really know what, what the best process is for moving that forward. You know, how many cases should people do? What does the observation look like? At what point should they co-mediate? Um, how does this affect confidentiality and durability of agreements? And I wonder if, I mean, I wonder if somebody were to write an article, if we could just put it on mediate.com and say, here's a, the suggested standard, you know, make, obviously you can personalize this for your own office, but just to give people kind of a springboard to start off of, so they could start to think about here's how we can get new mediators involved and here's a path going forward for them. I don't know, I, I think just seeing how other people have done that might be helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I know some people have talked about uh, if they're if they're working somewhere, then <clears throat> maybe setting up a mediation office or starting to do trainings in their organization. I know some people have talked about using that as a way to get experience. Um, I don't know. I think that one might be hard. You know, if you're working there, I feel like there could be a lot of confidentiality pieces and you don't want to screw up right in front of your boss. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I would think if it were, a, you know, maybe if it were a large company and it wasn't, you know, there weren't people that you're working directly with or you're, you're going to see constantly, you know, yeah. cause that's, that neutrality would be an issue, mm -hmm. right? Just like it is in schools. I, we do a lot of uh, peer mediation programming and, you know, part of our training with the students is um, you, you know, obviously you see this person around school, but mm -hmm. can you keep the, you know, what is said confidential and not talk to your friends about it? And B, do you have any sort of relationship with them? If you're just a, like in math club together and one's a senior and one's a freshman, you know, that might be okay to do because you can just disclose it. And, and if the parties are okay, then that's, you know, one thing. Um, but is it some, is it like your sister's best friend, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, one of the other things that I was able to do when I was first getting started was we had a neighborhood accountability board and they mediated, it was every Tuesday and Thursday night and they mediated victim offender and restorative justice disputes. So whenever there was a youth that had, I don't know, maybe vandalized the storefront, the part of their sentencing was they had to go through this accountability process. And you had a mediator there who would, who would facilitate the conversation between the youth and the store owner. And they would essentially say, okay, I'm sorry, what can I do to make this right? How can I, like, should I do community service? Do you want me to come in clean? Should I come and volunteer at the store? And, and it was a free service, but it was really powerful and such a great way to, I don't know, to get a lot of practice and to hone your skills. I haven't seen that in a lot of other communities and I don't understand why. I, um, 
it's a great service to the community. It's something that a lot of people benefit from, like a lot of new mediators would benefit from that experience. Is that something you all have heard of in your communities? Yeah, I wonder why. I know there are some, um, probably about 30 miles from me there, are, you know, sometimes the juvenile court will kind of order that mm -hmm. as part of, of what's happening. Um, I know in our area and every section of Massachusetts, it's like its own little pocket of difference, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and so I know in our area, um, there's not a lot of buy-in from the folks you know, that are making the recommendations to the court. So there might be some buy-in from the judges that, you know, mediation is works. Um, mm -hmm. And unless they're really a proponent of it, folk, like kids don't get sent to mediation for that kind of thing. Um, maybe if there were some more buy-in from like probation department or something like that, I think mm -hmm. they could facilitate that. But I just don't, from conversations with various officers um they kind of think it's a lot of hokum yeah you know yep. um and they feel like it you know it doesn't help much yeah yeah that makes sense okay um rainy are you scribing by any chance i am you are lisa okay yeah um i wonder if that could be a, a potential idea um, that if there, to find out if there is something like that in their community, and if not for mm -hmm. people who, who want to really start their career, maybe they could even look into starting it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what a great way to get to know the dispute resolution community in your neighborhood. Yeah, a friend and, and a, a friend of mine and myself were going to do a webinar. Mm -hmm. We're in Saskatchewan to advertise what mediation is because uh, we just started with the mandatory early dispute resolution on family conflict. Uh -huh. So what we're thinking is to offer like an intake for free or you know yeah. if they don't have money we can do it for free to get the practice you know more in family because I think that's what I'm, I'm a little bit scared more than than anything else, because I have done before, but never family. So that is mm -hmm. hard. Yeah. Um, I know the school districts um, in Colorado, um, okay. a lot of the Denver Metro um, corridor have restorative justice or mediations um, so it, it might be that the newbies would need to reach out to the mediators that they've hired to do that work to see if they could co-mediate. I love it. And then there is a conflict resolution center here too that's always looking for volunteers um, and they deal with a, a variety of issues. So there, there are organizations out there you just need to do some legwork to find out who they are and what they'll do for you. I love it. Yeah. Um, with so many things being online, I, I can't help but think that there have to be a lot of opportunities for people to mediate online and get some of these soft skills. Um, I, I don't know what that would look like. Uh, I know there are some dispute resolution centers that are doing all of their cases online, but I don't know, there have to be other opportunities, like creative ideas that um, that we haven't looked at. So uh, maybe even something like, I know there's always a lot of disputes on Facebook, you know, something about what if I, what if I mediate or, or facilitate the next city council meeting online, something like that. You know, and just just do like a look at social media, and when you see there are disputes, then maybe offer to offer your services to facilitate that meeting or have a guided dialogue, or offering free webinars or free trainings for those in the area that need it. I love that one.
Um, okay, we have a couple more minutes before. Right. I, should... I, I, I think like in the rural areas, your idea would probably flourish in the big metro areas. That's where I see, you know, there are obstacles for people getting the experience. But, you know, out in the counties where, <clears throat> excuse me, there are more critters than there are people, <laughs> it, you know, there may not be professionals out there that could um, offer that service. That's true. Mm -hmm. well, I guess because I lived in a very, very small community, like nobody wanted to me to get involved because then they feel like you are hearing what is confidential. Mm -hmm. So you can both. You know, you can go both ways. Or maybe churches, you know, reaching out to churches. Yeah. People have conflict, right? And uh, that might be another way you can kind of help folks. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I think any kind of community groups like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, courts, communities. Uh, and... Um, uh, I know that there's a lot of, um, uh, I can't think of the word right now. Um, like I wonder what I'm wondering about is having some kind of a, of a virtual reality or second life type of mediator, you know, again, while everybody's online, there are so many disputes in, in like gaming rooms or online communities. I just, I, I don't know that world well enough to know what that would look like, but I feel like there have to be some options there again, where new mediators can just start to practice their skills a little bit. Yeah, I don't know. That's, that's not my world. We'd have to, maybe Colin would know. We should ask Colin about some of that. Yeah, that's, yeah, that would seem, so I, I, I'm wondering, you know, I guess how much pushback there would be from participants in that like virtual reality or um your the Facebook like if you see a Facebook fight like offer mm -hmm. to mediate that um like how much people would be like just mind your own business you're not part of you know because I you know I think sometimes when you when you see something and you know you're just coming at it from a place of like I'd like to help and then obviously you'd like to gain experience, but you're, you're coming at it from a, like just an offer to help. I think these days it, it seems like people are just like, nope, just, you don't know me. Yeah. You don't know my business. I guess I, I wonder, you're right. I wonder if um, it might be more accepted if you're coming like uh, maybe to the head of the PTA or the head of city council and saying, Hey, I live in the area. You know, this is something I'm trained in. I know that you have a couple meetings coming up that are look like they might be contentious I wonder if I could help with my skill you know and mm -hmm. coming at it from an administrative point of view instead of from the grassroots grassroots point of view and saying well you all obviously can't get along let me tell you what to do <laughs> yeah yeah I think that makes sense okay um mm -hmm. I am going to head back to the main session and then I'll close okay. rooms in about a minute all right, thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Um, we, 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 we've had a very unsuccessful time because people have been able to join us because they're on the Portuguese channel. Samira and I are the only two people who've spoken to each other and people have just left. Mm, so we've got, you know, we've only just been getting to know each other. Really hasn't worked at all. Oh, how frustrating. Oh, that's. Uh, and also, I think some people left because there were two options to leave the room yeah. and leave the meeting. Yeah. yeah. So probably really, mistakenly, yeah. they left the meeting. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Jim came in for a short time, but said he actually wanted to be in technology. So he was the only other person that said anything. And then he left and went to tech. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, for instance, Larissa Leão is a Portuguese name. Um, Larissa, você fala inglês? Do you speak English, Larissa? Because you have some Brazilian names, I mean, Portuguese names. Yeah. So I'm asking them if they need. 
Yeah, I have a Portuguese surname, but I, 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 I don't know one <laughs> word of Portuguese. Ah, Larissa is the interpreter. I'm very sorry, because you're the one. It was okay. um, Patricia, I don't know how to pronounce this, M-A-M-E-D-E, -E, who wrote, wrote and said, we can't speak to you because we're on the Portuguese channel. Oh, yes, we are in the Portuguese channel. I didn't know that. Okay. Patricia also. Patricia is always an interpreter, Larissa is saying. Right. Uh, de português, Larissa? Well, um, I'm sorry. I'm trying to help. Uh, <laughs> it, <laughs> yes. You're doing a much better job Portuguese than I could. Interpreter or Portuguese, yes. Yeah, Portuguese <laughs> interpreter. Uh, Claire, I would like to say that was such a short time. We wanted to uh, visit all the rooms, but we uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, we got only one opportunity. That was <laughs> well, that is the the perfect intro for. Let's hear what the other rooms said. So, um, what I would like to do here. Um, again, we, we only have a half an hour and that time's just going to fly by. So I am going to be the timekeeper, I think. And, um, and we'll start with the first room and give you a couple of minutes to share what was your, what was your best idea that as you walked away from this, um, the, the thing that you think would help the most in this area. That being said, I know that you all, at least if my room was any indication, I know that you all probably came up with a lot of other great ideas that I don't want to lose track of. So um, if you could share your best and greatest idea in the joint room and then um, and then share the rest of your ideas via chat, that would be fantastic because we're, of course, going to be saving this chat and putting it up on the resource page. So. So with that being said, let's, um, let's hear from the first room, which was on diversity. Okay, so it's me and I didn't select myself. So I actually <laughs> wanted other people to speak, but I'll try to summarize. There were four points that uh, were discussed in our room. One is that we wished to have uh, the name diversity and inclusion because the inclus inclusion part is the most challenging one um, in our experiences um, because it, it takes intentional efforts. Um, we are diversified, but it takes intentional efforts to treat people in a way that they feel inclusive, that they feel included. Um, and that this is something that we have to do every day. So it doesn't rely only on training and creating a mutual language. It's also changing structural um, practices and uh, uh, organizational processes to cement it into daily life. Um, so that's that. We also talked about the barriers to inclusion the inclu inclusion of diversity, we talked about ignorance, um, we talked about power imbalances, the domination of most of the times white male, and we talked about intention. Um, you know, we do things automatically, unintentionally. So to be inclusive, we have to be intentional. Mm -hmm. So these are the like four points that um, I can stress in the limited time. I, I love that, thank you. And mm -hmm. I think you're right, intentionality about awareness is, is, is one of the keys that I'm seeing. Um, I, as a part of this conference, um, at one point we had everybody raise their hand, right? Their, their virtual Zoom hand. And it was very interesting to see that those who saw themselves in the in the majority hadn't done anything to their hand color. Those who saw themselves in the minority had changed their hand color. In other words, it was something that they were aware of. It was something that that was important to them that those who were in the majority and had um, had the privilege of not thinking about it just hadn't thought about it. 
And um, and I, I feel like that was a big eye opener to say, it's not enough to just not think about it. It's not enough to assume that, oh, they'll, they'll take care of it. Instead, I think instead it's incumbent upon all of us to say, what can we do? We realize that, that there are not the same doors. There are not the same pathways. There isn't the same representation. And that's our responsibility to make sure that we figure out how to open those doors, to make sure that we have um, representation in the articles on mediate.com, to make sure that we have scholarships going out to the people that, that do need to have those doors and pathways opened. Um, yeah, I, I completely agree, Safnat. Thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah, and I see that there are a few additions. So when we talked about intentionality, it's not only increasing awareness, it's in everything that we do in our actions. We also um, raised personal experiences. We had people from Africa, we were very diverse. And um, uh, somebody from Alabama in the 60s. Hmm. So we had personal experience being discussed yeah. and, and, and showing actually what we um, talked about um, in abstract in life. Mm -hmm. How does it go in life? And um, um, somebody here from our group said, we, we also impressed um, upon sensitivity to culture and religion. Um, um, yeah. The different groups in Kenya, for example, um, domination in those cultures. So I love it. Thank you. Um, so I said that I was going to be the timekeeper of the other speakers, Jim, Jonathan, Colin. I think one of you is going to have to be the timekeeper for me because I could just keep talking. This stuff is fascinating, but then I won't have a chance to hear what everybody else has to say. So with that being said, uh, let's hear from room two. So that's the technology room. Sure, I'll take an initial swing. I, I posted in the chat some of the topics we touched on, but you said to pick our best one. And I think I want to surface uh, what Rodwan talked about, um, especially about the importance of having the human presence in conjunction with the technology presence. And maybe Erica, if you could talk just for a minute about the program that you mentioned, you know, where there's there's mediation skills trainings with full-time mediators in schools and kind of the success you've had with that. I feel like that's in line with what Radwan is talking about, this notion of the importance of technology combined with human interaction. So could you speak to that for a minute? Yeah, sure. Um, we have a program that's called PMAST, Peer Mediation and Skills Training. And it's offered in schools in Western Canada here in, in um, Alberta and in Saskatchewan, I believe they have the RAP program, which is very similar. Um, they have small training programs for students, but what we actually were able to, once some funding was available, we actually were able to place a full-time mediator into the schools. And the principal and teacher were elated. They were absolutely excited to be able to take a conflict and speak to the mediator, get advice on, um, on how to how to handle it or have the mediator actually do the mediation. And they have a peer mediation training program where they train students between grade 10 and 12 um, in becoming peer mediators. And then they will co-facilitate with that mediator so that they can actually, and the, the only obstacle has always been funding because it's an extracurricular to the school. And uh, so some schools were able to incorporate it. And then it was a word of mouth from one principal to the next to say, this has been fantastic. We want to do more of it again. The issue was always funding, um, but they are still and transitioned now to online during the COVID uh, situation as well. So we have a starting place. We've done this for 20 years. Lots of volunteers that are teaching in those schools uh, programs, but considering that we were just trying to actually work with a software developer here recently and considering the struggle with funding, it's been an amazing um, journey that we haven't gotten any further than where we are at. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I will say I've, I've seen some very interesting uses of technology in conjunction with face-to-face -face mediators and teachers. Uh, there was a project called Otter 
O T T E R, which is a play on O D R, and it was for uh, uh, you know kindergartners and elementary school kids that had disputes on the playground. They could go on on this little you know tablet. There was an otter, a cartoon character that would walk them through asking questions about their conflict and gathering information, and then that information was distilled and shared with a mediator that could go and facilitate a conversation between them. So this gets back to Rodwin's point. It's not about technology eliminating the human interaction. It's about, and in the ODR field, we talk about the fourth party and the third party. We need the humans to work with the technology and they're allied together in order to increase <laughs> effectiveness and, and, and uh, essentially grease the skids for the use of these services. So I think Erica, what you're talking about is a perfect example of what Rodwan was discussing, the importance of that human presence. Yes. So that was our big takeaway, Claire. Thank you, I love it. Um, I, I think, I think probably my biggest takeaway was the importance of just getting out there and becoming comfortable with the technology so that you can best support your clients regardless of where they're coming from. So mm -hmm. learning how to use WhatsApp, learning how to use digital Samba, just becoming comfortable with the technology that your clients want to use. I, I do think that's our responsibility instead of forcing them to come and use our technology just because that's what we're comfortable with. I really think we need leadership in this. We need to pull this all together so that it becomes a bigger, not just each group individually, but that we are a bigger organization to really yeah. support all this. Gosh, if only we had an international organization that had somebody who knew something about technology and dispute resolution. I just, gosh, I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> I, I agree with you, Erica. And I'm, I think that's the direction we're heading. Thank you. Okay, uh, next, funding. Um, hi, I was in the funding group and um, with just a few people. And, um, you know, grants seemed to be the main source that we talked about. Um, we also had some individuals who were teaching interpersonal conflict resolution skills at community colleges. So maybe finding positions at those schools. Mm -hmm. Good. And then another option um, was finding an existing law practice and arranging to do um, youth mediation to help with parenting plans or, or anything interpersonal. And we had one person in our group who wanted to talk more, but I don't know if she's still on here. I'm here. I'm here. Oh, go right ahead. Hi. Um, I'm, I'm working my full-time job. I'm in doing this during my lunch, but oh, if the phone rings you. or a student comes in, I need to sure. jump out real fast. Um, so I have my master's in mediation and conflict resolution, but my background is like social services. I've worked in a community college and recruitment for almost 15 years. So I didn't, I had the passion, but I didn't really have that specific um, mediation experience by being a lawyer or a social worker. Um, but by chance, there was a position in a nearby town um, at a um, counseling and mediation um, practice that I applied for. And it was for family and divorce mediation. I didn't know that at the time, but she reached, the owner reached out to me and said, um, I'm really hiring for a divorce mediator right now. Mm -hmm. But when I began mediation 20 years ago, I did youth mediation. And when I saw your resume, you jumped out at me because this is something in, um, I'm in Northern Illinois. It's unheard. It's just, no one does it. There's two of us in the county that um, have that specialty with youth mediation in the divorce realm, in the divorce world out here. Um, so, um, I was hired on contractually, which completely worked for me. She's taking a percentage of my pay per hour, but I would not have been at this point if I would have tried to do it on my own. So it's a great place because the base is already built for me. She has an office and she has, you know, her marketing when um, we're doing social media. And we were told the same thing, like social media is the way to go. Don't spend your money on other avenues when you can hit all of those piece, people through social media as well. Um, as cases come in, they get referred to me. So I'm, you know, I'm working contractual, which is fine because it's a nice slow start. Um, 
but that, that was a means of funding for me when I had zero funding. Mm -hmm. So, um, the next step would be once I've gotten my feet wet and feel a little bit more confident to then sell it to the schools, I am going to start looking into grant funding to go into the schools to mediate. And this is what I did for my graduate practicum. I worked with um, a school district in a community college when there were students in conflict um, and the social workers were like, this is like, it's, I, I don't like dismissing it and saying it's drama, but in junior high, there's a lot of dramatic relationships and fighting and squabbles again, you know, among friends. And they would bring me in and mediate these, um, these groups of kids so they can like move on. The parents can be less stressed. Mm -hmm. Um, I worked with boys who continually got into fist fights. I was able to mediate, um, when none of the counselors, the principal, they're like, we've exhausted everything. We cannot figure out what's going on, why they keep, keep fighting. So, um, so because I had that experience, um, that's my next step is to find that grant funding so I can go into the schools and um, be a mediator for instances like that, yeah. I think. Thank you. Yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, training. And I will be good. I'll keep you on track. So let's say a couple minutes for training and then um, uh, a couple minutes for um, career and mental health skills. Okay, thanks, Claire. So I'm back home, by the way. So. Yay, hi, Ella. <laughs> so yeah, hi. Um, so uh, I was the scribe and yeah, basically I think we kind of focused only on one. I, we didn't really, we went really deep into one, which was the standardization um, challenge mm -hmm. and basically I think the main takeaway from our session was that training should be incredibly comprehensive and holistic so the ideas that came out of it were that um, you know start with code a code of conduct and look at different codes of conduct yeah. and then um, go you know beyond that so we're talking about skills um, looking at different professional uh, contexts um, looking at um, how different people react to being in different um, situations. So you put a different person in the mediation role play, you're going to get a different um, outcome. So make the training more about how, you know, asking people how they would react to a different situation. I think um, like somebody, uh, Tim suggested that, that the approach of, of Plato, um, look at cultural context, um, uh, look at standards, look at ethics, um, and also look at how trainers themselves are trained to deliver mediation training. Um, and so, yeah, I think that was basically pretty much what came out of our session. So I, I put some notes in the chat so you can you. see the main takeaways. See from that. Those. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Love it. And career. Hi. Um, so for career, um, one of the things, you know, one of the, the major challenges um, was essentially, you know, how do you get after your training, how do you get table time? Um, and so some of the things we came up with, and I'll put everything in the chat, but I thought one of the great things that one of our participants, Red, Rennie, said was mediation is like swimming. If you're not in the water, you're not doing anything. And so, you know, basically people need to find a way, whether that's volunteering um, with a community mediation center, um, volunteering to be a Zoom moderator um, for another mediator um, and you're, you're, you're doing the Zoom part and, and you get to listen to the mediation. Obviously you'd have to sign the confidentiality agreement and everything. Um, or even you know seeking out uh, neighborhood account accountability boards or offering to facilitate a meeting for your local city or school board or something like that if there were gonna be some contentious issues. Um, just a way to uh, get your name out there, get your skills out there um, and see how you can move forward. Absolutely, yep. Um, it's true, I and thank you for putting this in the chat because there are so many great ideas out there about um, about advancing your career. Again, there are a lot, there are a lot of new opportunities right now with so many things being online that 
I think it makes sense to brainstorm those and share those ideas. You know, there are some new paths towards becoming successful in this field that we shouldn't ignore. So thank you for that. And then finally, take us home, mental health skills. Thanks, Claire. I think that's a very interesting session and I'm gonna keep it very short. Uh, an interesting uh, tip to take care of uh, your burnout or your stress levels, anxiety levels during the day. Someone said, you should watch cartoons. <laughs> Maybe uh, that's something we've forgotten, all of us. You know, We did this <laughs> when we were very young and we would watch uh, all kinds of cartoons and that kept us very free and we never bothered about anything in life. And maybe we should just get back to watch cartoons. But uh, there were so many other really nice ideas of how to just get your mind off things. I put it in the chat box, please feel free to go through those. But I think the biggest takeaway and you know, our, our key idea was a lot of people resonated with this that we should try and create a kind of a mediator caucus groups uh, and media.com to take a lead on this. Uh, where you know you could come and share your struggles, uh, what you're going through as a mediator in the professional world, where you will not be judged, and you can talk about things freely. Um, um, uh, so that's something that they're really looking forward to. Secondly, maybe uh, media.com could uh, work together on putting down a few tips and instructions on how to handle mental health. Uh, uh, so especially, and I think this is very helpful. Uh, Maybe it's for it's for my generation and those coming after me that you know for us it's it's getting a bit more crazy because we're just starting out in the in, 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 in our young I would say or our early careers in the mediation world. Whereas there are people who have done this for for decades now and they could bring in all the experience and all the expertise about how they have handled pressure, how they have handled stress and anxiety and, and competition around them. And uh, so maybe uh, a few instructions like that could also help uh, people. Uh, manage their mental health better. But the media to caucus groups, I think, is the take, biggest takeaway here. And uh, everyone would appreciate it if media.com could take the news. I message heard loud and clear. I, I agree with you. Um, and that was one of the big takeaways from, I would say, the entire weekend was uh, something that I think we all need to learn from a little bit is that mediation can be such an isolating field. You know, I, we, we feel like, oh, we need to figure this out on our own, or I don't want to breach confidentiality, or I don't want it to look like I don't know what I'm doing. And so we often, um, we often do isolate, I think more than we should as mediators. And that was one of the biggest things that I walked away from this conference from is the new mediators are naturally congregating, right? They're naturally forming these support groups and community rooms and chat rooms and ways to connect with each other. And that was something that they were asking for even more. And I do feel like that's missing a little bit in our field. Um, I don't know what the best forum is for that. If it's something that mediate.com should host or if there should be a, a Discord group or LinkedIn groups or something, but to have there be more forums for gosh, I would like to have, uh, I'd like to practice doing breakout rooms, or I have an interesting case that I would like some feedback on, or I just had a really tough case and I would love to debrief with someone who understands. Um, I'm seeing heads nodding. So I do really feel like this is a need in our community. I don't quite have the answer yet. So I would love to hear some of your ideas. Uh, maybe this is something we can, mediate.com can discuss and come up with some ideas, but um, but I, I really feel like that's, I don't know, maybe it's just after this whole year that we've all kind of said, I miss you. I want to talk to you. I want to share my experience and I want to hear your experience. So I, I hope that this continues and that we can take some of this energy and use it to connect with each other even more. Um, with that being said, I promised Jim I would give him a couple of minutes and Woody as well, if you're able to, um, just to close out what a fantastic year this has been with all of these task forces. Um, so uh, with that being said, again, thank you so much, Jonathan. This has just been an honor and thank you all of our participants here today for sharing your ideas. Um, I just can't, can't tell you how much we appreciate this. So thanks to all of you. Okay. Now I'm not seeing Woody here. Anybody else see Woody? Mm -mm. Nope, he might have right. had to hop off. Um, and uh, so uh, just to kind of do a nice closing here, hopefully, you know, ready or not, uh, last March, suddenly all mediation that was taking place and all mediation training 
that was taking place was taking place online. Okay. And, and, and we just like couldn't, but acknowledge that there really has been a paradigm shift, mm -hmm. both in services as well as training. And, you know, Mediate is a technology company. And so really the question for us is how can we best assist? And in this area of youth and schools, there's two main areas one that I see. One is online education or online supported education. It doesn't have to be 100% online. It might be hybrid, but uh, online technical resources, best practice information, um, both for entire populations, entire schools in trying to improve culture and capacity. And then also, of course, for peer mediation and other focused service delivery. And my main point here is that the delivery of online education is fully scalable at extremely low cost. And so here, I think we can do our best to stimulate the development of best practices, best resources. Colin, this is a place where competition will sometimes and contest, mm. just like the article, okay? So I think we can stimulate the development of best practice educational resources, both generally as well as for the service delivery programs. And then there's the issue of delivering the services. And one thing I became convinced of today is you're never gonna be able to preclude people from communicating whatever way they want, uh, in addition to whatever platform opportunities might be made available. And that's perfectly fine. I think that exists generally in the world of mediation. There are a lot of side uh, communications, but it seems to me that a rate determining step for public entities of which schools are, you know, at least public schools are a good example is they need to kind of do the right responsible thing. And today that includes consideration of privacy, confidentiality, security. And I think that they do in fact need to make available best practice online, private secure communication platforms so that they at least make that available as the opportunity, knowing that people will make additional choices uh, also. So I think there is a, a technical opportunity for us there, somewhat similar to the community mediation space uh, where there are real needs to manage data to ensure security. And uh, so I couldn't be more excited about uh, a facet of what's taking place uh, than the fact that we could scalably bring best education and best platforms for services to not just to adults, not just to fee paying adults or people who have filed lawsuits, but to our full society, including our youth. I, what a gift for the future. Yeah. And uh, so I wanna thank you all so much. You are now on our forum mailing list. So you'll get a notice of the uh, video uh, location of this forum, as well as all the other forums. We are developing these, this report over the next month or so. Uh, we're hoping to release that right around July 1. I anticipate that we'll be having a July forum relative to the entire report. And uh, I just am so pleased that for the community sector, for schools and youth, we are doing so well and creating such valuable resource and relationships. And I just want to thank you, especially Claire and Jonathan, Colin uh, as well, Woody, not here in the moment. And uh, look forward to seeing you all online soon. Colin, this is where we go ahead and do a little clap, I think, isn't it? Absolutely. Thank you, everyone, for your, your contributions. Thank you, around everyone. The globe, around the globe. <laughs> Love it. Thanks, everyone, right. be well. Have a good weekend. Yes. Claire, Thanks. last word. Thank you, everyone. Such an honor. I can't wait to I can't wait to continue this conversation with all of you.